Hi, my name is Rasum Kanana. I'm 20 years old. I'm from Zimbabwe and my major is finance and banking. Hi, my name is Anne Forsyth. I'm 21. I'm half Thai, half Asian, and my major is PR and advertising. My name is Pierre Shawiyah, I'm 22 years old. But I'm from Thailand and my major is international relations. Hello, my name is Zach Garrett and I am American. My Major at Stanford is Journalism and Broadcasting, and I'm 24 years old. In 2016, just under 300,000 women and just over 50,000 men were the victims of sexual assault and rape in the United States. Here in Thailand, this year, hashtag Don't Tell Me How to Dress gained attention after Cindy Bishop, Thai American model and activist, started the hashtag after women in Thailand were told to dress more modestly during the Song Front Festival to avoid sexual assault. We're going to turn to our hosts now to understand more about why the women may have been told this and if it is fair to draw a correlation between immodest clothing in women and sexual assault in rape. Antonia, we're going to start with you. What's your take on this? Well, I wanted to just make sure that everyone knew that I was definitely for this movement, and I think it's a great thing that that's what she did. But I also think it's a little bit almost sad that it took a famous person to shed light on such a big issue, whereas the issue itself should be able to stand on its own without having you know, the media and everything coming to cover it. So you think that it's uh, overdue a little bit, or that maybe the people who are drawing attention to it are just drawing attention to it because of their, their frame and platform. Yeah, and also because like, oh, maybe if I look into this, I'll be closer to this celebrity, you know, <laughs> that, kind of, that kind of mentality. The association. Of yeah, and I think that people are not really understanding what the movement is really about because all this fame and like all these famous people are being a part of it, but they're not really understanding what, what are they standing for? And what, what are these like, activities that they're doing, these photos that they're taking, what do they stand for? Whereas compared to like, what other people may think, is like, oh, you know, Luke and Metini did this, or Cindy Bishop did this. Maybe if I connect myself to that movement, they'll see that I'm interested. Does that it make sense? sense? Yeah. What about you guys? Do you have any others? What I, what I hope to get out of this conversation is that, like Antonio is saying, Sometimes I think the meaning in these big hashtag movements is sometimes clouded with people just trying to jump on the bandwagon mm -hmm. of the movement and not really understanding uh, the deeper meaning yeah. behind it. So maybe this is a great opportunity for us to be able to talk about what the deeper meaning or the meaning of the hashtag is. And for me, it's the deepest question in this movement is, are women who dress immodestly almost asking for it, asking for sexual assault, asking for, no. for rape, just because of the way that they're dressed. And should that be a consideration for women? Should they have to think about what they're wearing, whether it's immodest or whether it's flirty, as just going out? And, and especially it's related to the Songkran event because that's when it originally started the hashtag because there was a piece of data that uh, came out in Thailand that 60% nearly 1,600 women said that they had been groped during Somkran, which is a huge number. So obviously it's a big problem here and, and of course in other places in the world. In the US, the hashtag uh, MeToo movement is gaining a lot of traction as well. Can I just say that you know, Somkran, <laughs> yeah. it's really, really hot, okay? Yeah. I don't, I mean, as a girl, I don't want to be wearing long pants and long sleeve shirt because I'm scared that a man's going to be touching me or groping me or whatever. I want to be able to feel free in my own skin, you know? If it's hot, I'm going to wear shorts. But that doesn't give another man the excuse to think that it's okay for him to touch me. You know, and I think that that's something that male individuals or anyone needs to be taught instead of being taught to sexualize women. I think it's completely not okay that they think it's fine because, you know, they're asking for it. I mean, I'm wearing shorts now and I'm not asking for it. I could be standing here naked and I'm still not asking for it. Yeah. And I think the crazy double standard that do men have to think about that? 
Do men have to think about, oh, well, if, if I work, are my shorts too short? Or my, am, is my tank top going to attract women? Am I going to be victimized? Like, I don't, you know, obviously men are, according to the data that we introduced at the beginning of this segment, men are the victims of sexual assault and rape. But to me, they don't have the same pressure. They're not given the same responsibility that women are given to almost like pander to the way that somebody is going to react to the way that they're dressing. It's like, because I, I always feel like it's a really bad double standard to say, well, well, you have to watch out, ladies. And I always hear parents saying this to their female children. Mm. It's like, well, you know, guys are this way and this way, and they're going to look at you this way. Why, don't you, why aren't you talking to your male children yeah, and exactly. saying it's not okay to be this way? Yeah. It's not okay to objectify women or to touch them ever, no matter what they're wearing. Yeah. Like, I always feel like the conversation is skewed to force the female to have more like responsibility yeah. for this issue then and the males are just well boys will be boys sort of thing but i think that's sorry i think that's a super shitty excuse yeah. oh i totally agree i think that's completely unacceptable to think to or bring up your child to think that it's okay to do something because you are of a male gender so you think suddenly that you are more superior to the female gender right. which is not you know and women should be able to think whatever they want wear whatever they want and feel comfortable in what they're wearing and there shouldn't be another party or another group of people telling them otherwise. Like this uh, Catholic article yeah. that I read for St. Mary's. St. Mary's, yep. Yeah. It was a blog article written yeah. by St. Mary's about the 10 reasons why dress you should modest. dress modestly. And it, oh, it just makes me so mad. <laughs> what, what specifically made you mad about that article? I just think that, you know, I understand that it's a religious understanding that women should dress the way they want to be portrayed but why can't we just dress the way we want and have our you know our knowledge and the way we think the way we do things to be how it represents us right. you know like if i'm wearing shorts okay i get it if it's in like a business setting but if i'm in a water fight i'm not going to be wearing a suit you know it's kind of ridiculous I mean, what do you guys think as men? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I was going to bring up the point about how, you know, it's important to dress how you want to be addressed. And um, yeah, just like you were saying, uh, you can't wear short shorts and a crop top to a business meeting. I feel like we all have a right to wear whatever we feel comfortable in, but then there are times when it's appropriate and there are times when it's not appropriate to wear certain types of clothing. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, just to add on to what you had said. But I, I, I completely agree with, uh, with the sentiment about how male children should be taught at a young age and even even at an older age, just to reinforce it, that it's not okay to go around groping women based off how they're dressed. It all comes down to consent and just respecting each other as human beings. So yes, um, that's all I wanted to say. And what about you, Peter? Yeah, I think like I agree with her as well. And that, like, let's talk about like you know some crime and with the case of Cindy Bishop. Yeah. She she was getting like you know molest, uh, like sexual assault anyway, and she was not wearing anything like you know that is sexual. Yeah. So I guess it's like men have to be able to control themselves and you know like yeah they must be taught, like taught when they were younger. Yes. I think it's about control, but also about how much they were taught to respect women. Like I totally agree with that. Cindy Bishop, she had these uh, ex like an exhibition of clothing that victims were wearing. And one was wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and suddenly she was asking for it. That actually made me really sad because we're at a time now where people should already know that this is not okay. And it's not okay for you to think that just because I'm wearing shorts and I'm the minority gender, that you can come and touch me because you feel like you can. Right. And I just think that you know it's time that us as a society, we need to evolve into this way of thinking because then we're not going to grow. And we're just going to live trying to fight battles against each other when we should be fighting battles with each other. 
I totally agree with that. And the point about that, what is asked, what kind of clothing is asking mm -hmm. for? Because mm -hmm. when the argument comes up about, oh well, when women dress in a uh, you know immodest way, then they're targeted for sexual assault. Well, I was reading a whole article. It was a really good article by Sophia Ahmed, and she was detailing many, many stories of Muslim women's experiences of being sexually harassed in extremely modest clothing, in hijabs. So the idea that it's just because it, it's only women who are dressing in this like uh, scantily clad way that are getting targeted is complete rubbish. Yeah. Guys are going after many women, and it's in no case is it okay, in my opinion. Which I think we should all at this point be on board with. <laughs> and I also think that it's a problem because the more it happens, the the weaker we feel as a female race. I mean, female gender. Sorry. And the more it happens, the less we are willing to talk about it, and the less we are willing to admit that it has happened because we know that the system is not gonna support us and it's not gonna help us get justice. Because if a man does it suddenly, it's okay. But if a woman is getting victimized for something she had no control over, suddenly we can't talk about it? You know, it just makes me so angry, it's so emotional. And I think that the anger is totally warranted and as a gay person, I can personally say that it, it I think it's almost like a power thing in some ways yeah. because I think that the the dominant um, people, unfortunately, for a long time have been like straight males, and so. Um, but even in the gay community, people who are like believe that they're like older guys have like I've been sexually assaulted multiple times. So um, you know, it's it's really goes across all genders. But I totally agree with your point that by talking about it. We really are empowered because, and especially to have like a diverse group of people talking about it, I really appreciate because I think that it lets everyone know that you know you can be supportive of. Because the main thing is that you're supposed that I think you should be supportive of women, especially when they come out and tell their stories, because it's not easy, especially when history has proven that we're not always believed when we or supported when we come out and, and say things like that. And I just want to say that I'm not like bashing the male gender. It's not about not liking the male gender. It's about equality, you know, the, the equality of power, of, you know, your, your voice to speak. And I think that women should be able to have the same power and the same confidence in themselves as much as if a man were to do something or say anything. Yes. So did you hear that? <laughs> okay, I want to leave you with this question. I want the audience to be more engaged with our conversation, so I'm going to ask the audience a question based on this conversation. Is asking women to dress more modestly to avoid sexual assault or harassment or abuse productive? I'll leave you with that. We're on to our next topic. is whether a big age gap in a relationship is a deal breaker. Let's turn it over to our hosts. What do you think, guys? Do you like them older or younger? I like them younger. Younger, okay. And older. Depends. It depends. <laughs> so we have three yeah. different opinions, good. Yeah, um, I think when it comes down to age gaps in relationships, Personally, I don't feel it should be a, a major factor because it all comes down to how you connect with the person on an intellectual level, on an emotional level. And uh, I mean, look at the case of the French Prime Minister Emmanuel Macron. He's 40 and his wife is 65, but they still they have that deep emotional, mental connection. You, you get what I'm saying? And. Um, yeah, just, just looking at age, I mean, obviously there, there are limits. You can't be a 40-year-old guy dating a 17-year-old girl. I mean, <laughs> it's illegal. It's just completely, yeah, that's a whole other thing. Exactly. It's, it's a completely different thing. Uh, but yeah, I think as long as, you, as long as you get the person that you're with and you connect, it shouldn't be an issue. And another thing is maturity. Uh, a lot of girls 
not all girls, but no, a lot of girls, <laughs> uh, are concerned about uh, dating a guy younger than, than them because they feel like if you date someone younger than you, then they might not necessarily be as uh, mentally mature. Right. But that's not necessarily the case uh, with all guys. I mean, you find some guys who are more mentally mature when they're 18 compared to some guys in their 40s who still behave like children. You get what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so I don't, I don't feel age should be, you know, um, a major, you know, a major concern for relationships. I mean, you can factor it in, but it all comes down to how you click and you know what you both both want out of the relationship at the end of the day yeah yeah and i think that that's a good point to bring up that it's about a deeper connection and it's not always about just the number of whether somebody's a little bit older or a little bit younger in the articles that i was reading about this i really wanted to focus mostly on our personal experiences but i thought this was interesting they said that the two biggest things to watch out for when there is a big age gap is developmental milestones and just your priorities because they made the point that sometimes for a 32 year old and a 40 year old they're both sort of in the same season of yeah. their life Maybe they've already gone through their 20s and they've gotten some career success under their belt and they're both in the age group where they might want to start a family. But from my own personal experience, the oldest person that I have ever dated was, <laughs> was like in his late 30s and I was uh, like, I don't know, 22 or something like that. And although we connected on a lot of different levels, the deal breaker was because we were really in different seasons of our lives. You know, I really wanted to finish my school and get into my career and he was ready to settle down. And I'm definitely not like a house husband type, so it just didn't work out for that reason. But uh, I think that it, that's true. Like the priorities and the milestones of just where you're at in your life play a big factor. Yeah, I think that that's actually the most important factor when you look into dating people that are much older or much younger than you and I think that clicking is just the surface of it because that's kind of like the beginning of the relationship where you're just yeah. finding out what you guys like that make you click blah 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 but then when it comes to the more serious things in the relationship it could be the, the deal breaker you know like okay if you were 38 and I'm 21 you probably want to start a family have a house whatever I want to finish school <laughs> yeah. and I want to have a career before I even think about moving on to that mm. lifestyle, you know? So I think that, I mean, it all has different factors, but I think that, I mean, what you say and what Zach has said is they all kind of, you have to weigh up the odds and stuff, you know? Yes, just like in any other relationship, yeah. but I think just the microscope is a little bit more intense yeah. when the, the further the age gap is, which is my own opinion about that. What about you, Peter? Yeah. I totally agree. Like you know, you have to talk with like you know when the time is say like uh, you I'm 30, 31 and she's like twenty five or something or twenty, then like you have to talk you know about like yeah, what you really want to do in the future. Because if then I'm really an ambitious man and I'm really want to uh, be a successful say like a businessman or something, I have to work abroad and all that. Would she be okay with that? You know, because you have to agree with this and stuff. Yes, exactly. And uh, one piece of data that I wanted to bring up is that they did a, there was a survey from Emory University that surveyed 1,000 people in the U.S. And they did find that couples with a one-year difference were optimal when it came to divorce rates. So when um, there was a one-year difference, there was only a 3% divorce rate. Five years difference, 18%. 10 years, 28%, and 20 years was 95% divorce rate. So I think we can be really optimistic about the fact that, oh, yeah, it doesn't really matter that much. But when you look at data like that, it seems to suggest that the further the age gap is, the more difficult things are, especially when it comes to a couple staying together long term. I guess it's like... I don't really want to say it like I'm targeting a group of people, but I think it's all about what you want out of the relationship, if you know what I mean. No, you have to elaborate. <laughs> and tell me, what do you mean? Okay. I, mean I, I don't have any examples to give, but you know those old men that are in their 70s uh -huh. and they're together with someone that is in their late or early 20s? 
that could work because maybe he or she wanted something out of the relationship that wasn't more intimate and oh. related to their goals and aspirations. And do we feel like that's okay? Do we feel like that? that love is love. Place, love but, is love. Yeah, it's mean, just a number, but just you know, talk about other choices that you have to make as well. I mean, this is a time in your life that you're willing to give up to be with someone. Yeah. So you need to make sure that you guys have your mutual interests and making sure that you know there's a mutual understanding as well. So. So I think that from this conversation, we found out that maybe communication is really key, especially with the age gap in the relationship, and also to think about what your priorities are. And always put yourself first. And, <laughs> and you heard it from Antonia first, always put yourself first. So I also want to end this segment with a question to the viewers. What number is too big? in an age gap where it's just a deal breaker for you and you would not date somebody that was that much older or that much younger than you. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Subscribe, like, and all that jazz, and look forward for our next episode. Bye!